Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on January 25th here at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to do what we normally do, and that is to read our daily lectionary texts for today and talk about it a little bit and see what uh, what God might reveal to us. Um, we're in a new location today. We're actually in the prayer room at the church. And uh, we might just try doing different things in different places and stuff just to add a little variety, a little spice to life. But um, looking forward to getting into God's word today. And so let me start with opening us up in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the way that you continue to call us to be in a closer relationship with you. Uh, that we would be transformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we would be witnesses of your kingdom uh, to the world. Thank you for your word to us today, and let all that we do and say today be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, and useful for building up the community of faith. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So today uh, we are going to start with Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you established the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of their peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together. For joy. In Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our uh, Hebrew scripture prophetic word today comes from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 12. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While in, I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the survivors of Israel? I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, 
to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you. On a day of salvation I have helped you. I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, Come out to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the ways, and on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them down, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will turn all my mountains into a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Lo, these shall come from far away, and lo, these from north and from the west, and these from the land of Sine. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. And from the New Testament, we'll read Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned, for until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Our gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 6, verses 13 through 29. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. 
Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the lot, land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, last week, Natalie, you just jumped right in there and uh, really hit it. And I'm like, hmm, you're going to jump in there today? <laughs> I think it may be your turn this week. <laughs> maybe my turn this week. <clears throat> now, I haven't quite, I don't know, I'm, the, the link is not jumping out necessarily at me. There were some thoughts on the Isaiah passages you were reading there that I had. Um, but what did well, you get well, at? Well, why don't, <laughs> sorry. Well, why, don't, why don't you share some of those Isaiah thoughts? Because uh, right, that Isaiah 49. Yeah, get over to Isaiah. Yeah, let me get Isaiah over to Isaiah 49. Isaiah and, um, yeah, how do you make a connection between Galatians, John the Baptist being beheaded, and Isaiah... Yeah, tough call well, today. I'm not going there. Okay, you're not going there. Okay, well, <laughs> no, give, yeah, give your thoughts and let's see how let's see how happens that. Yeah. Okay. No, I um, no this this concept of as you were reading Isaiah, you know, it's um, obviously a first read for us today. <laughs> um, no, this concept of of this time, you know, that um, called me before I was born, mm. and and so throughout time, no matter where. There was a calling before they were born. There was a usefulness. There was a purpose. Um, and that has all been in place. Um, and when you think about it, and, it, and it's using this, this imagery of, of a sword and an arrow and hid me away in the quiver, and there's this usefulness. They, there's the, these metaphors to tools that, um, that would have been used for, I mean, hunting and food and, and needs to, to meet needs. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what to do with that. But as I, that's what jumped out at me initially was this whole, we were made with a purpose. Right. And that purpose was there. And it, you know, you talk often about, you know, that this concept of time and that, mm-hmm. it, that God is, is throughout, you know, and, and we were too. Mm-hmm. Um, we were called before we were born. He right. has a purpose for us. And even as it goes through, and I don't remember here, um, talks about not being useful. Even if we, you know, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing. 
but that's not, you know, that's a, that's a human, you know, we right. may feel that, right. but the reality is that, again, we were made and created for a purpose, and, um, I, I think you know that could be our connection then because if you look at John the Baptist and you remember the stories that we hear in the gospel about how while he was in his mother Elizabeth's womb how he left for joy right. when he heard the voice of Mary who was then pregnant with Jesus mm -hmm. and so there is uh, uh, I think that concept of the calling prior to our birth that they are going to be used for specific purposes uh, this, this uh, Isaiah 49 is, um, it is a messianic prophecy. It's talking about the servant that will come, uh, talking about how, uh, and I know I've even preached on this not too long ago, that verse six, you know, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. You know, your job is gonna be to be the light to the nations. And so, you know, obviously this is fulfilled in Jesus you know God does send prophets and God does send teachers and so there's partial fulfillment throughout these things mm -hmm. but if we think about what you were saying in terms of God knowing us ahead of even our birth uh, calling us to uh, purposes for which you know he has designed and then we think about John the Baptist and how he went out and he he proclaimed and there were there was repentance um, but then, right. but then he he you know, he ends up in the prison with Herod, and because he was, in a way, you know, a sharp sword and an arrow that was piercing Herod with truth. It's like right. you should not be with your brother's wife. Right. Right. And then I wonder if John the Baptist himself could have said, "I've labored in vain, you know, my what am I, I doing? Spent my yes. strength for nothing in vanity. You know, no one's really repented." Um, but. But we see even how in the uh, you know the passage of John the Baptist being beheaded follows after Jesus is doing good work, right. and his name is being made known, and everyone's just like, well, who, who is this guy? And this is there's there's the debate: Has John the Baptist been raised from the dead? So even that concept of being raised from the dead is um, is at least being explored. Who is this Jesus guy? Right. How did John publicly proclaim him? Um, and we know that uh, that Jesus was not just for the Jews, but was for everybody else. Um, I think I'm having a little bit of a hard time, even with the Galatians passage, because uh, this is where um, uh, Paul is is criticizing the uh, the other apostles, or at least Peter by name, you right. know, it's like you're, you know, come on, Peter, you're not, you're not acting like you're supposed to be acting. You right. are uh, making a distinction again between Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles. and 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 I think about how that must have been for Peter, how you know his entire life he had been taught. You know, these are clean, these are unclean. This is ceremonially pure, this is ceremonially unpure. Uh, these are the relationships that you're supposed to have. And I'm struggling with these new relationships and how to interact with that. Um, and, and back even to the Isaiah, it's, it's, too, it's too light of a thing for Jesus to just be only for the Jews. The Jews. Right. That it's bigger than that. It's, it's reconciling of, of very different people to God so that they can also be reconciled to one another. And, and Peter himself is still struggling with that. You know, this is, this is you know, Jesus' number one disciple, and he struggles with it. Right. And Paul says, hey, man, don't, don't act hypocritically. You know, right. you know that you're no longer under the law. Why are you calling these people to be back under the law? Right. So maybe that's why it's so hard for us sometimes. You know, we can read these things, we can hear these things, we go, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then we look at people that are different than we are, and we go, not today. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's going to be too hard. I don't want to cross that. I don't want to cross that barrier. You know, I like my little, I like my little stuff just to myself. Right. Mm. Well, and I think sometimes we want to hold people to the standard of the law. Well, we hang on to, well, I'm extended grace. 
I'm extending grace, but you know what the law says. Right. 100%. And so, right, but this idea, you know, the law didn't offer salvation. It never did. Right. right. And it, you know. It... Right. No matter how much you followed those things, you could never follow it perfectly. Right. It didn't undo sin. It didn't undo sin. It just pointed it out. Right. right. Yeah, right, right. And it didn't offer salvation. Right. So I think that those right. are two things that sometimes I think when we read about the law in Scripture, I think sometimes, um, and, and we don't necessarily see it here, but even the Pharisees and things like that, when well, we followed the law, we followed the law. It didn't prevent sin. Right. Even within them, even as well as they followed it. And it didn't offer them salvation. Mm. Um, no matter how closely, um, you know, and it, and it says, you know, if, if justification came through the law, then, then Christ didn't have to die. Right. Because it would have been for naught. Mm. It would have been for nothing. And so um, using that standard of the law as the end-all, be-all doesn't work. Um, there's more yeah. to it. Oh, 100% agree. 100% agree. Um, and so isn't it interesting then in our own lives how um, I guess the, 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 the continual challenge is it is a good thing to follow the law. Right. That's the whole point. You know, I mean, you know, that's a part of it. Right. It is a good thing to follow the law. You know, in so many other places, you know, we read it in the Psalms that, you know, the, the law is a good thing. The law uh, teaches us uh, about righteousness. It, it gives us direction in how we should go. And so, uh, but, you know, Paul's argument there in Galatians is exactly what you were saying. It's just the law didn't offer you salvation. Salvation came through Jesus Christ because it was forgiveness for the ways that we fall short. It was uh, loving us for for who we are, not how we act. Um, and you know how what an ongoing crazy concept it is for us to right. to reconcile. Well, and I think too, it's you know if if we love Christ, if we follow Christ. We will be transformed. Mm. And in that transformation and in that love God, love neighbor, the law falls into that. Mm -hmm. And so just by natural, mm -hmm. you know, progression as followers and believers in grace, it then allows us to live into that law, I mm -hmm. think, um, better. Right. Um, well, King Herod... You know, he was the king of the Jews, and right. he was supposed to be the example of following the law. And here right. he was with his brother's wife, and it's like he was breaking the law. That's 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 a no no in the law. Right. And so John points that out to him, and rather than repenting of poor behavior, he imprisons right. John, and then ultimately betrays, uh, beheads John. Um, and so, you know, I think from an earthly, uh, you know, either politics or monarchies or whatever it might happen to be, whatever your political uh, thing gets into, you know, it, it is kind of funny how, uh, what, are we, what are we bombarded with in the news today? Well, look at how many of our elected leaders are actually breaking the law. Oh, oh, but I didn't do it on purpose. Or, oh, oh, that was an oversight. Or, right. oh, oh, well, my, my law breaking is not as bad as other people's law breaking. And it's this constant um, affront to us in a way. Here are our elected leaders that are themselves breaking the law. That if, if we were to do that, we would end up in prison. Like right. John the Baptist, right? I'm calling them out. But, <laughs> um, but there's, there's this uh, natural human tendency to break the law. Whatever law it might be. The right. law of God or even the law of man. Um, we break them. Right. We cannot fulfill them. And so there has to be salvation in something else. Uh, and, and jumping back to that Isaiah, you know, it's too light of a thing for you to just rescue a small group of people. You need to show the light to everybody. And this is where, uh, yeah, you know, the law could never satisfy that. But Jesus, through his life and death and resurrection, uh, did. Right. Hmm. It's always nice to end on that Psalm 91. And I wonder if John the Baptist was 
thinking of that psalm as he was rotten away in prison. And I wonder even, you know, as the, as the jailer's sword is raised, uh, maybe he's going, does Psalm 91 really count for me? Um, yeah. But even, even if it is not completely fulfilled in our lives, we know that it is true. We know that ultimately, um, those who put their hope and trust in the Lord, as Jesus conquered death, uh, we then will conquer death as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there are going to continue to be trials and tribulations and persecutions and, and death even. Um, yeah, but holding to Psalm 91 um, in the midst of that, I think, does give us strength. And, you know, and again, I, I can't imagine being in prison awaiting an execution and stuff, but uh, what words would you rather have on your lips? Mm. A little sobering. A little bit. Yeah, good stuff Thank today. You. Anything else you want to add? No, I, uh, you know, as followers of Christ, it's not always easy. You know, hopefully we don't end up in prison <laughs> awaiting beheading. Right. If but, only we were so bold, right? Right. But, mm. um, But what comfort we can take, you know, that's, you know, I think sometimes our difficulties would pale in comparison to that, even though they can feel so overwhelming or we could feel so stuck. Right. But yet, um, there is hope. Mm -hmm. and, and there is resurrection in Christ. Amen. So. I think let's, uh, let's end on that. All right. All right. Sounds you want to close this in prayer? I would be happy right. to. Gracious Lord, thank you for your words to us today. Thank you for this time um, that we have together. And I pray that um, you use your word to us, that um, we take those words to heart and that um, we recognize your role in salvation and the invitation that we have to um, join you as we are invited in as a uh, members of your family, and that we can go out into the world, that we can shine a light, and that we can um, show the glory to you, and that we are justified and made righteous through you, and that we don't try to take that on ourselves, because we know that that is impossible. We, we can never attain that. Um, it is through you and uh, your Son alone that we can be made righteous. And in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us again today. If you do have any questions or comments or concerns, please do reach out to the church, and we'd be happy to listen to those and to pray with you and discuss any issues that you might have. Um, actually, this coming Sunday, both Natalie and I are going to be out of town. We're going to be at the Eco National Gathering in Newport Beach, California. Kevin Huddleston is going to be preaching at both services, 9 and 11.15. There will be Sunday school in the middle, and we've got things lined up for that. So if you are in the San Angelo area, please do consider joining us for worship and for fellowship together on Sunday morning. And if you're not, uh, you are welcome to join us online, and uh, we look forward to uh, an opportunity to meet together when that time comes. Thanks, everybody. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Take care.